Well, quarantine life continues for many of us around the world, uh, the MMA world, no exception, many of us sitting at home. So we thought we'd bring you another MMA Junkie live chat. I am Mike Bond, John Morgan, not in the house this week. So we brought in the next best thing, Farah Hanoon. Uh, Farah, obviously, we haven't spoken to you on one of these yet. Um, I guess just off the top, we're all dealing with you know, similar circumstances around the world. But here I am in Toronto. Uh, can you tell us what life is like for you, you know, over on the other side of the pond? Uh, it's all right. I mean, actually, it's not as bad as, as the rest of the world. Like, we don't have as many cases uh, here in Egypt or, or as recorded. Uh, I don't know what the real numbers are, but uh, there's a curfew. So uh, I try to get out only when I need to, but uh, it's mostly just uh, working. I try to pump out some interviews and stuff like that. Yeah, and you've been doing a great job. We'll get to some of those later. What time is the curfew at? Uh, 7 p.m. Wow. So it's like sh shortly... Uh, like after I'm like done working and stuff like that. So I don't really get much time to, to get out. I'd rather not to be honest unless I really have to. Yeah, fair enough. So like how um, strictly is that enforced? If you're caught out outside after curfew, what, what happens? Uh, there's a fine. Um, trying to like convert that to dollars. What is like 4,000 Egyptian? So it would be, um, and then it's not too much, a couple hundred dollars. Uh, so uh, probably should be higher. But yeah, there's a fine. So it should be pretty strict. But I still kind of hear people out past 7 p.m. So not quite sure how strict it is. Yeah, I was going to ask, like, does it seem pretty dead on the streets, like at night? Or is there still people, you know, out there messing around a little bit? I can hear people sometimes. So uh, I don't think uh, people are still following it properly. But I'm pretty sure if they're caught, then then they'll do it. They'll probably get in trouble. I mean, they should at least. Very interesting. Well, we are here to talk about MMA. It seems like one of the few things in the world that has not come to a standstill this week in particular has been super crazy. I mean, I guess we need to start out uh, UFC 249. It seems like this event is going to happen. Uh, some reports come out from the New York Times last night. Here we are on Wednesday about a location you know, at the Tachi Palace tribal land. But let's rewind a little bit before we get to that part. Uh, let's start with the new main event. Of course, Habib Nurmagomedov not defending his title against Tony Ferguson on this card the fifth time this event has fallen apart this matchup between these two just unbelievably bad luck but tony ferguson versus justin gaethje is a ridiculous fight i think you say you know, any day of the week you bring that match up to someone and it's uh pretty promising i think 17 bonuses in the ufc between these two guys just unreal just when that fight really came up just give us your take on you know the actual matchup itself all this craziness outside but aside I mean, honestly, it's the best possible replacement they could have come up with. I mean, you look at Justin Gaethje, he's enjoying his best career run in the UFC, three straight first round knockouts. So he's a very worthy guy, like the perfect guy to, to fill in that spot. And we don't always, it doesn't always pan out like that. So to, to have Justin Gaethje come in and stylistically, you know, I, 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 it could turn out to be a better fight than what Ferguson Habib would be. I mean, on paper and, and the history and everything, I mean, I personally would have wanted to see Ferguson and Habib, and I think everybody else can say that. But on paper, I think it could deliver one of the best fights we've ever seen. It has all the makings of it, and I just don't see uh, how this fight could, it could be boring. I mean, we could end up with a shockingly quick finish, but it just has all the makings of an absolute war. So I think, uh, like, we've been given a, a hell of a matchup in, considering the circumstances, and Kudos to Justin for, for stepping in and kudos to Tony Ferguson for still wanting to fight. Yeah, are you surprised? I mean, I guess either one of them that they took this fight. Ferguson, so much to lose. If he loses this fight, I don't really know if we're ever going to see the Habib fight come to fruition again. Ferguson's 36 years old. Look what it's taken to him to even get these fights. You know, at this point, he's on a 12-fight winning streak. You'd have to imagine if it goes down, uh, it's going to be a hard situation for him to get himself back into fighting Habib again. And then Gaethje, he has made it very clear over his career that he doesn't take short-notice fights. But I think this one is kind of unique in the sense that I think this fight between Ferguson and Habib was announced in, like, December or something like that. And we've always known that the possibility of this falling apart again existed. And we've talked to Justin Gaethje pretty much since day one. Would you be the backup fighter? There was like some flip-flopping on whether he was officially there, whether he would step in, all these different things. But in the back of his mind, he's had to know that this existed as a possibility, whether he was fighting Habib, whether he was fighting Tony. So um, in your mind, are you at all surprised that both of these guys took this fight? Or do you think the cards just kind of aligned in that way? Uh, I think for, for Justin, he's looking at it as a kind of a win-win situation because he said in a recent interview, he's like, if I lose, I'm still where I'm at right now. And, and he did say he had to sleep on the decision a bit. His coach was a little tentative, uh, Trevor Whitman. 
Uh, but he said he's been preparing kind of sparring since January, helping his teammates, Austin Hubbard and Neil Magny. So he's been in the gym. He's been active, obviously not training for a fight, but like he's been uh, training and he sees this as a massive opportunity. It's a shot of the UFC title. And when you fight, uh, it's the interim title, but when you fight for an interim title, you're getting paid uh, like a champion. So there's a lot for him to gain in this fight and he can position himself to fight Habib. A lot of people think that he could be the guy to, to beat Habib. And I know uh, Dustin Poirier said it. A lot of guys are saying that they don't think it's Ferguson. They think it's Gaethje. So uh, he can position himself. If he comes in on short notice and, and stops Tony Ferguson, who's on a 12 fight win streak, uh, becomes interim champion and gets to unify with Habib. I mean, he just put himself in, a, in an incredible uh, position in a matter of days. So he's got a lot to gain. And I do kind of agree with him that if he loses, that he's not going to lose too much because he was struggling to get a fight. There was discussion about a Connor fight potentially in the summer, but we never know what Connor is going to do. And if it wasn't Connor, he was probably going to have to fight down somebody lower than him in the ranking. So I think even if he if he loses to Ferguson, those matchups in the top 10 lightweight division are still there for him. So I kind of agree with him in, in the sense that he actually doesn't have that much to lose in, in the Ferguson fight. Yeah, fair play. I mean, we just saw Conor McGregor fight Donald Cerrone off two losses. So if Gaethje loses here, it doesn't exactly preclude him from still getting that fight. And you're right about the money aspect of it. Too. I mean, it sounds like Gaethje got a new contract. I uh, saw Ali Abdelaziz tweet out that their negotiations with the UFC were pretty smooth. It was like two hours, but even just these smaller elements like his uh, you know, promotional compliance pay, the Reebok money, quote unquote, if you want to call it, he goes up from $5,000 to 30000 for fighting for this belt. So like that's even just a nice jump right there. Um, but you did mention the interim title aspect of it. I mean, personally, I saw this coming. If they were going to do a replacement fight for Ferguson, like we kind of know how they operate on especially with the numbered events the pay-per-views they like to have a title fight on there whether it's legitimate interim or otherwise you know some controversial aspects we've seen them slap on titles onto fights like this before um in this situation it seems very deserved but tony ferguson fighting for an interim belt for the second time he could be the first two-time interim ufc champion which is you know a little bit of a crazy statistic but any you know issues on your side with them adding an interim title here to me i think it was you know the play that just fits in the UFC's history of business practices. So it didn't surprise me, but any issues with it on your end? Uh, nothing crazy. I mean, as long as, of course, like when I know Ferguson was probably speaking out of frustration when he said Habib should get stripped. So that was nonsense for me. But uh, the interim title, I think at this point, like a lot of uh, champions, I felt like in the past used to get bothered when an interim title will get created because it kind of takes away the validity of them being champion. But I don't think anyone cares anymore because they understand the business model of the UFC. And when you're talking about people watching a fight, like we understand the sport, the, the diehard fans do, but at, at a casual fan or a fan from the outside, if they just see a gold belt attached to two, two fighters fighting in the main event, it just makes it all that more interesting. But when you look at it, um, attaching a belt to this fight particularly because you've got two very worthy guys. So in that case, I'm not too bothered. I mean, if you had two... Uh, guys ranked in the lower end of the top 15 that were fighting for an interim title, then maybe I'd have more of an issue with it. But uh, yeah, it is kind of just for, for the, the pay-per-view and, and all that stuff. But I, I don't think it matters too much uh, just as long as, you know, we're projecting Habib to, to return around August, September. So it should be fine. For sure. And even if it is September, I mean, we had an interim title last year, like this break for Habib, you know, not that we wanted or anything. It's actually going to be longer than the fight that he had between Connor and Poirier. And they did an interim title there between Poirier and Holloway. So this isn't actually, you know, really unprecedented in the way they do it. So um, I'm, I'm not surprised by the interim title aspect of it all. If it sweetens the pot, gets the fighters paid a little more, I think that's all right. But let's move on a little bit from that fight and just look at the event as a whole. Um, it seems like this is going to take place at Tachi Palace, as I mentioned off the top, tribal land in California. Uh, but it's a very complex situation. I mean, the Ring Association of Ringside Physicians had come out saying they recommend you know all combat sports events come to a standstill. The California Athletic Commission released a statement in that New York Times report saying they're going to have nothing to do with this event, despite Dana White saying previously to ESPN that there is going to be some sort of commission oversight. Uh, the ABC is not wanting to talk about this at all. They pretty much gave a no comment to people inquiring on that. Uh, what do you just make of this whole thing? You know, them taking the event to tribal lands, basically going to be self-regulating. Um, 
you know, Dana White was saying that the fighters aren't even going to know where they're going to be going on the night of the fight. But it seems like with these reports coming out, we are going to know where the location is going to be. So that element of it seems a bit squashed. But just this this whole aspect of, you know, them putting on the event under these circumstances, uh, what's your take on it? I mean, I think they're going to come across more and more hurdles. Like every day we're hearing different different things. So I think they're just kind of taking it day by day. Uh, it's pretty crazy. I think in, in the mind of Dana and the UFC, it's as long as they're doing everything they possibly can, because that's what they had in mind, then that's what they're going to do. And if hurdles keep coming up, they're going to keep trying to battle through them. And if they can't, for some reason, in the end, like it's not going to happen. They're going to say, we've done everything we could possibly do. I just think it's that stubborn mind of, of Dana and him wanting to make it happen. It is pretty crazy. I mean, he's talking about a private island and stuff like that for, for uh, other fighters that, that that are stuck maybe in, in, in the UK or in Russia. I'm not, that, I, I have no idea how that's going to work out. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I expect them to run into a few more obstacles, but I feel like they're taking it day by day and the fighters seem to be left in the dark as much as we are. Cause every time I speak to somebody different, I'm like, what's the communication process like? And they're like, ah, I don't know. Like I'll just, like when I find out, I find out. So it seems like they know as much as we do. If not, we may know more than they do. So uh, I feel like they're just training and, and staying ready and literally waiting for new information as each day passes. Yeah, what does your gut say right now? I mean, we've done these the past two weeks, uh, John Morgan and myself. The first week, I said I felt pretty confident they were going to find a way to make this work. And then last week, I you know was pretty doom and gloom. I think I put like a 20% chance on them finding a way to make this happen. Right now, as we stand, I feel more confident that they are going to find a way to execute it just because it seems like they have a location. Uh, it seems like the fighters are in. They announced the card. Uh, it seems like they're dead set on making this happen, whether it's a good idea or not but we are still you know i think 11 days away many things can happen i said it in the column that i wrote like there's no guarantees they bring the fighters in on the tuesday wednesday of fight week and then even by the saturday even on that saturday something could happen that could preclude this event from unfolding as they hope we really just don't know it's impossible to sit here and give a real real answer but in your mind what, what do you think do you think this event ultimately happens in some shape or form april 18th I do. I think probably like 70, 80% chance. And if it's not the whole card, then maybe four or five fights. I just feel like they'll keep doing everything possible to make it happen. Right now we've got a full 12 fight card, but if for some reason some of them can't make it, I think they proceed with four or five. I mean, we've seen uh, kind of the measures they're taking to, to make this happen. So I, I say probably 70, 80% chance it does. Very interesting. And yes, you mentioned the 12 fight card uh, that was announced. They announced you know, all the bouts on there. Some events that were originally supposed to be on UFC 249, some fights moved from other cards like Francis Ngannou, Jairzinho, Rosenstruck. There, there's a lot of meat on the bone here if they can actually pull this off. It's a it's a pretty nice fight card from top to bottom. Um, anything really jump out at you on terms of like what you're looking forward to, assuming all these fights actually happen? I mean, uh, the Ngannou fight for sure, just because he's been so eager to, to just not only get back in there, but he's wanted a title shot. And he's last few times I've spoken to him, he's been super, super frustrated. And then this happens of, of all things. I can only imagine what was going through his mind. So I know in terms of Francis, he'd probably do anything to, to fight. And for Rosenstruck, it's a big opportunity because he knows Francis is the guy to beat if you want to come near a title shot. So um, it's a big fight, and, and both have got huge knockout power. Honestly, like, I know I don't want to jinx it and say that it's going to not go past a few minutes and end up being a 25-minute war where they get tired and stuff, but it's just one of those super, super intriguing uh, matchups because they both pack a crazy amount of power. And then you've got more one of the more underrated fights like Nico Price, Vicente Luque. That's got fireworks all over it. They fought once before. I just spoke to Nico last night, and he's so excited to get this opportunity to run things back with Vicente. So that's another great matchup. That's what I'm saying. Like a lot of things fell apart, but somehow they managed to put it together. Like for Nico losing uh, his fight, his opponent with Muslim Salikov and, and Vicente Luque losing Randy Brown, we end up with that. I mean, we it's probably better than what they originally had. For sure. Yeah, you got to, I mean, circumstances aside, you do have to give Sean Shelby, Mick Maynard, Dana White some credit for being able to cobble together fight cards like this. It's not like this is the first time we've seen this, but in terms of the fight card as a whole, um, someone in the comments, Marcus3XTV asks a very legitimate question. Do you think 
the UFC fighters will get penalized with a pay cut for missing weight for UFC 249. Obviously, these circumstances are extreme. Uh, the training camps have already been affected via the gyms being closed down, a lot of people having to do stuff from home, not having the same nutritionists, like uh, just all these things that exist going into a weight cut. Uh, what do you think? Do you think it would be unfair for if someone misses weight uh, on this card to penalize them the normal percentages of purses? Or do you think maybe since it's self-regulated, uh, there's going to be some more flexibility in terms of how the UFC handles any athlete who may miss weight? I honestly think we're going to see some catch weight fights. I wouldn't be surprised. Like the week of the fight, I, I expect some people to come in and be like, look, I can't make 155 or 170. Because some people already knew they, they had a fight. Some people didn't. So, right. uh, And some people were fighting sooner than, than others. So it's kind of hard for them. And when you're going through a certain kind of regiment with your diet and all of a sudden you have to speed up the process. So I wouldn't be surprised if they threw in a bunch of either 175 or 160 pound catch weight fights. I, I think it's kind of like the least of their worries, especially some of, if, if we're not talking about the championship fight, of course. Yeah, for sure. And I also saw someone ask about Greg Hardy being on the main card. Why not put Hardy on the prelim main event in front of more viewers? Uh, I think that's kind of the avenue they're going with Francis Ngannou and Jairzinho Rosenstruck. That seemingly is going to be the you know, ESPN featured bout. And that fight was originally supposed to be on ESPN as well. It was supposed to be a headliner there. So maybe they feel like they owe ESPN that particular matchup or something. I feel like sometimes we do, you know, get too caught up in the actual bout orders of these events. Like most of us, I feel like are probably watching all the fights anyways. So what does it matter if you watch Greg Hardy fight at 6 p.m. or 8 p.m.? Uh, you know, I can understand the actual main event slot, but in terms of the bout order, any any beefs with that? Or do you kind of sit on the same side of the fence as me in terms of you're watching all the fights anyways? Well, I'm certainly watching all the fights anyway, but people on my side of the world may not. But when you talk about the main event being what it is, they probably will stay up. But what it does for, for people who may not be super diehard fans is they get to see a caliber fight like Francis Ngannou and Rosenstruck before it hits 5, 6, 7 a.m. So, yeah, it does give an opportunity for people to stay tuned as well. So if you weren't planning on staying up for the fight, you see a fight like that, uh, it could pull you in to watch the rest of the card. So I think when it comes to the other side of the world, uh, it's important because, uh, you know, I always say it's not always the, the diehard fans that are watching, especially now at times like this where people are looking for something to watch. Uh, I think it's kind of tactical in that standpoint. And like you mentioned, it was on ESPN anyway. Uh, so in, in in their defense, like they, they probably weren't expecting like to be on the pay-per-view or maybe they were, but I mean, like it, they, they, were, they weren't before. So, um, yeah, it just makes sure that people stay tuned in throughout the whole card. For sure. And um, it seems like a couple of n number one contender fights on this card. I mean, we look at the Nganu Rosenstruck fight, uh, Jessica Andraj, Rose Namajunas, uh, you know, on top of the interim title fight, it seems like there could be a couple title eliminators there. Do you imagine the winner of both those fights? I mean, Andraj rematching Zhang at this point, maybe if she wins, might be a little too soon. But looking at kind of just those boats in general, do you feel like those are going to bring us some number one contenders at heavyweight and strawweight? I think if Rose wins, then for sure. I mean, Zhang has already spoken about the her wanting she'd love to fight Rose even after she lost to Andrade. So uh, I think if Rose wins, then then one hundred percent we see that. Uh, especially that playing f into factor how Rose was doing so well in that first fight with Andrade. Uh, I agree with you that maybe they wouldn't run things back with Andrade unless she comes out and absolutely dominates Rose and makes an like a huge statement or something like that. Then maybe. But Rose, for sure, I think if she wins, she's next. And uh, Francis Rosenstruck, I think it's a pretty obvious, considering where both of them are. I mean, Francis, uh, if he can knock out Rosenstruck, he's he's knocked out the last three guys in the first round. And Rosenstruck's uh, undefeated. Uh, and you take out Francis, who's positioned himself to be next in line. I think that one's a pretty clear cut. But the problem is it's like with DC and Stipe, that hasn't been booked yet. So uh, Timeline-wise, for now, if DC Stipe happens in the summer, it all works out perfectly. Uh, if not, um, but I think they should be next. For sure. And going back to Rose a little bit, are you surprised that she is fighting on this card? I mean, she, unfairly or not, stemming from the whole Brooklyn Conor McGregor incident, gets like labeled as being you know mentally fragile or something like that. Um, so under a condition like this, and maybe it helps a little bit that her very good friend and teammate, Justin Gaethje, is now fighting. They have similar coaches, you know, same training environment and everything. But, you know, he wasn't added until just a few days ago. And from everything that I was hearing, she was intending to fight regardless. Uh, any surprises 
that in the midst of a pandemic, Rosnami Nunes, who's gotten some criticism uh, for, you know, the mental side of things, is competing on this card with seemingly no issues. Uh, yeah, no, I'm, I'm not too surprised because I think uh, for her, like she felt a bit burnt out after the first fight with, with Andraj. You know, she was doing so well in that fight. That's got to play in her head uh, in, in terms of her confidence and how well she was doing. So she knows what she's capable of. She's looked phenomenal in her last few fights. So for her, if it's an opportunity to get back to to the title picture and, and she she's already familiar with Andra. She's already been preparing for her. Uh, this isn't like the bus incident because she was like in the bus and she was directly affected. This is kind of something that's affecting the entire world. So while everybody of course is having to make adjustments in their training and stuff like that, um, I, I think if she's already been focused on on fighting and, and training and she's already put it back in her mind that she wants to get back in there. Cause I, I thought she was gonna end up taking a longer break the way she sounded after uh, the loss to Andrade, but I think after they put pen to paper and she's been in training camp, I think I expected her to make it to the fight. For sure. And um, we did mention to switch gears a little bit. We mentioned it a little bit earlier in the conversation, but Fight Island, UFC Island, Dana White's Island, whatever you want to call it. Um, this He comes out and just kind of drops this nugget in his interview with TMZ first, and then he spoke with ESPN's Brett Okamoto, who, and he dropped the word, I have an island face, kind of just, I think, was all of us in that moment, Brett. It was kind of funny. But just the concept of this, I mean, when you first heard and maybe saw the story or the headline, whatever the case may be, Dana White looking to secure a private island for future fights, what was your first reaction? I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like they're doing everything they possibly can, like so persistent, uh, which I can, I can respect in Dana's standpoint. I mean, maybe not in this during this global pandemic because there's health, uh, uh, like health issues and stuff like that. But that's who he is. That's who Dana is. He's always been like that. So for him to go to extreme measures of an island, I mean, I don't know how they're going to pull this off or what they have in mind. Sometimes I don't even know if Dana has something 100% secure yet or not. But he seems to get super frustrated from the media lately and all the questions, naturally, all the questions that we're having. But, yeah, I mean, it's crazy. I, I wonder how they're going to get people to come over to the island because the point of the island was for, for the international fighters that couldn't uh, make their way to the U.S. So how are they going to get people from the U.K. and Russia and Poland, I don't know where, all to come to an island? Or I have no idea, to be honest, like or, <laughs> how they're going to pull this off. Yeah, the logistics of it just seem a little bit crazy. I guess just as a follow-up, you mentioned you know Dana White and everything and just his relentless pursuit of being so dead set on putting on events uh, in the middle of this entire you know global pandemic and everything. Uh, it came out, interestingly enough, a sports business journal report, I think it was last night, that basically had a little bit of information about the UFC's finances. It said, uh, according to the report, if they put on 42 events, in 2020, they're going to get something like $750 million from ESPN, which is obviously a significant portion of money, uh, something that they're going to need you know, even more now that they're not going to have any live gates coming in, all these different elements and stuff. Um, so... You know, Dana White says we need to get back to business. We're putting on events every single week. You know, we're going to start cranking out fights, I think was his uh, quote exactly. With all these put in, I mean, does, does this give you a bad look at the UFC at all? Or maybe like a sign of desperation that they're seemingly willing to go to every measure possible, including securing their own damn island to put on fights just because, you know, when all the other sports around the world are still on pause in the middle of this situation? I mean, for sure, it, it does, uh, like the general public is looking at it like that, as in uh, you have to be more cautious sometimes, I guess, because they're so unknown and they're so uncertain. And and the whole point of being cautious is so something bad doesn't happen. You don't want to go out and try because it's a massive risk. I mean, if, if God forbid somebody uh, gets the coronavirus and everybody's around, everybody, it's a contact sport and spreads it to everybody, then, then what? Uh, was it worth it after it? So of course they're taking a massive risk. If it all, if they pull it off and all goes well and and nothing happens to anybody, then they look so smart and look, we we've entertained everybody through these tough times. And I told you we should pull through. We shouldn't sit there and succumb to it and and whatnot. But it's just crazy because like MMA is a contact sport. So uh, in terms of not only training because they're they're having to adjust training, but we don't know what each fighter is doing in terms of their training if they're taking those risks. And I know that's their own responsibility. But having to train for a fight and, and being in a contact sport like MMA and then having to gather people in an event, even if you limit the corner, man, there's so many people like cameramen and security and 
so many people in one place. So uh, it is a massive risk that, that they're taking with putting this fight and, and the the judgment is warranted. I mean, naturally, I know Dana's frustrated because he's trying to make it happen, but like it's inevitable that you're going to get uh, people criticizing when the entire world is on lockdown. I mean, airports are closed. People are stuck at home. There's a reason for that. And to put a fight to get like to put an event together is pretty crazy. So I, I respect his drive, but it's also a massive risk that he's taking uh, should anything go wrong. Yeah, absolutely. The The risk there is heavy. I mean, I don't really know the level of backlash they would get if someone does test positive in relation to one of these events. Um, but I guess, you know, does that element with kind of knowing behind the scenes that there is this, and we, it's not like we're oblivious to knowing there's financial incentives in the UFC putting on cards. That's kind of obvious for any sport. But, um, you know, does that side of it, like from what this report says, they just need to put on these events. Like they could literally have any fighters, any fight, they could have slapped together any two names to headline UFC 249 and they still get their fee. Um, does that, you know, change? Um, of course, Dana White, those people, they're business people, they want to make money on that side of it too. But does that kind of skew your perspective? It doesn't really necessarily make it feel like their main intention is just to get this back to give the people something to watch. There's, there's more to it, obviously. Yeah, I mean, if there's pressure uh, business-wise in terms of, like you said, to put a certain amount of events, then yes. But the thing is, all the fighters are willing to fight. So if the UFC do receive backlash, the, their easiest response will be, well, the fighters want to fight. 99%, 90% of the fighters said they do want to fight. Very few said they don't. And if he has Dane in the UFC, he'll be like, whoever doesn't want to fight doesn't have to fight. He's going to look at it that way. So as long, I mean, if the fighters are willing to go out there and compete, they know the risks. So if they're going to put themselves out there and, and risk um, their health or safety or potential like that, then I guess we're each one of us are, are responsible for our actions. So they could, I guess, I mean, that's an interesting point. If they all took a stance and said, we don't want to fight if they were, uh, what would have happened then? But uh, they all seem to be willing to fight. So when in terms of, of the USC and, and Dana and stuff like that, they're probably going to be like, well, they want to fight and we want to put on an event. So why wouldn't we? Yeah, just so many layers to that. I mean, of course, you could argue if you know if there's a union in place like other sports, you know, maybe they'd be have something to prepare themselves like this where they'd be getting money regardless. They wouldn't feel any sort of pressure to compete. You could also make the argument, you know, these fighters, you could say they know what they're getting themselves into, but at the same time, they're inherently maybe not the best group of people in the world when it comes to uh, validating, you know, risk and everything. They're getting in there and, you know, taking punches in the head in the living or for a living. So they're not necessarily the people to trust in terms of self-preservation. They're willing to put themselves in dangerous situations. But uh, it seems like regardless of, you know, what the media thinks, what everyone thinks, we are going to be moving forward with these events. It's going to be you know, pretty curious to see exactly what measurements they take in terms of protecting the athletes from COVID-19 contamination. In your mind, you know, what would make you feel most comfortable? Of course, we would prefer every single person there be tested for COVID-19, but it's just such a complicated element. You could test someone on the Wednesday, and there's no guarantees they couldn't contract it from somewhere else by Saturday. Um, just so many different elements to go into it. Uh, what, would, what do you think? What would make you feel comfortable in terms of safety precautions for UFC 249 and beyond while this whole thing is still going on? I think just... The distancing, I mean, you when you compete, obviously you're going to have to be in there with your opponent. But other than the testing, if they could just limit in terms of transport, uh, having full buses and, and having everybody together in the same space and stuff like that, if they could just uh, limit that and in terms of the locker room and have people coming in and out at completely different timings. Uh, if, I think they were doing that in Brasilia. I can't remember who I spoke to from that card, and they were saying that uh, they were transporting each person on their own and they were making sure that they weren't there in, in, in the – the locker, but then again, they were in the locker room with some other fighters because how many locker rooms are they going to come up with for, for people to prep before the fight? So, as much as they can, I guess, so like the distancing and in the turn, like Gaethje was saying something like, I'd, I'd want to be on a private plane, like he, he wouldn't want to be on a plane full of people when he when he goes to um, uh, to, to California or for, from Colorado. So, uh, as long as they could do that, I mean, they're not going to come up with a private jet for everybody, but as long as they could do that in terms of as much as they can in terms of transport locker room prep and all that just keep it distant and have each fighter and at least his team two or three people completely separate from the rest yeah, I know actually uh, WWE because they did their WrestleMania you know, two-night showcase recently, and I saw a report come out that apparently they were replacing the ropes and the mat and basically cleaning the entire facility from top to bottom between each match. Uh, 
just given the fact that they're going to be live on television and pay-per-view, I don't think that's just technically possible under these situations for the UFC. So, yeah, it's going to be pretty interesting to see exactly what they do, what measures they take. Dana White seems pretty confident. Uh, they're going to be going above and beyond. I don't think he's exactly on point saying that you or I – right now sitting at home are in less danger than we would be, you know, being at the event next to him. That was a pretty you know, ridiculous statement, but nevertheless, uh, Dana White has a few of those up his sleeve. But as we go to wrap up here, Farah, I know you've been doing quite a few interviews this week. You've talked to like Wonderboy, Bohovic, Rafael Dos Anjos, Nico Price, and more. Uh, anything that you kind of want to plug or stands out in terms of interviews that really, you know, caught your eye speaking to a variety of people over the past few days for MMA Junkie? Uh, well, yeah, the, when I spoke to Bahovic, he was uh, talking about how um, he was getting emails from the UFC that were saying that he, he's next in line. And then Reyes was saying that he was having private conversation with the UFC about him running things back with John Jones and stuff. So that element is always interesting to me, that the communication process. I always ask fighters, like, what are the UFC telling you and stuff like that? I get interested in that part a lot. And it seems like they get you can get promised something but but you might not necessarily have it and um yeah just the the conversation with Bahovic was interesting because he was saying he was he's not willing to fight for an interim title he's like it's title or or, or bust basically whether he fights for a vacant title or or I don't think they'd strip Jones if he's not out for a very long time uh it'll be interesting to see what they do with Jones but he he wants to fight for the undisputed title and then Reyes is talking about he's been told about a rematch. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. But obviously, we need to see what happens with Jones first uh, before these guys. And um, yeah, just like speaking to Nico as well, he didn't, he seemed to not know a lot uh, when I was asking him about the communication process of the UFC. He's like, I don't know. I'm just training, waiting for them to tell me. And wherever they tell me I need to be, I'll be there. So that was another interesting point that they seem to be as much in the dark as, as we are in terms of all this. Yeah, and I actually haven't spoken with you since the whole John Jones thing happened. Of course, you know, that thing moved pretty quickly from the time the news of his arrest came out, then the footage, and then his plea agreement. It all happened in the span of like a week or so. Uh, and, you know, it seems like a, a whole bow was put on the situation. He's back out there, you know, seemingly hanging out in the mountains of Albuquerque and whatnot, you know, riding around on a scooter. But ooh, just your take, what do you think happens with John Jones next? Do you think it's a while before we see him fight? Do you think he takes a little time to, you know, apparently he says, he has a you know, bad relationship with alcohol or whatever. Do you think he takes some time away from the sport to get all those ducks in a row? Do you think we see him maybe fight you know, at Tachi Palace or UFC Island in the near future? What do you kind of just make of where things stand with John Jones at the moment? I'd say probably not until the end of the year. And I do think they'll probably come up with an interim title, whether Blachowicz probably says he won't fight for it or not. But I do see like right now they're just dealing with so much in terms of private islands and putting events together. So I don't see him being a part of any of these uh, events anytime soon. Um, probably end of the year, I think. Once his name is, is out of the, the media and, and the negativity is out of the way, it's kind of like, um, like in terms of PR and stuff, it, that always comes into play. Like right now, anything he says, if he comes on and tweets something, he's gonna get a barrage of, of criticism, stuff like that. So I think for him to be out of the headlines in every shape and form, well, will be good for him if he could take some time off and just focus on himself. And right now, it's it's not the most pressing thing. He just fought at UFC 247, so that helps him that it's not like he competed last September or, or, or August or something like that. So I think he'll be fine to return at the end of the year. There's no need to rush him. He should just focus on himself and, 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 and getting uh, healthy and, and focusing on his issues and then see him back at the end of the year. And if the, the top contenders get anxious and the UFC feel the need to slap an interim title – uh, for an event, especially in these times, and they'll probably do it, and winner could just fight Jones at the end of the year. Yeah, and just last thing on Jones, I mean, Daniel Cormier came out and basically said he didn't think uh, this plea agreement is going to deter future issues with John Jones. I kind of echoed the same last week speaking with John in terms of just like, you know, it seems like we've heard the the house arrest, we've heard the uh, ankle bracelet, we've heard the interlock things. These are all punishments that he's had before and none of them have really seemed to rattle the cage enough for him to change his behavior. Um, do you agree with Cormier? Do you think this is, we ultimately, this isn't the last we've seen of John Jones in terms of, negative headlines i don't want to say you know legal or you saw it or otherwise but do you think this is kind of the end of it or do you think this is not going to be something that's going to change his behavior 
I mean, I don't know. I don't want to talk necessarily about him doing bad things and stuff like that. But the, the punishments do seem like a bit of a sap on the wrist. So I, I do understand that because, um, like, he's not getting punished. Like, he's been through all of that. Maybe the first time it was a little bit harder for him. But, like, this is all literally a sap in the wrist. So if you're, if that's what's going to happen every time you do something bad, then it's not crazy to think that he might do it again. Uh, so until you're talking about like serious jail time or something like that. I, I feel like a lot of people are just going to like, we see it with Connor sometimes as well. Every time it's a slap on the wrist, community service, pay this amount, do this and that. And then, and then it's just maybe they're back to their old ways, but, but yeah, only John Jones knows that answer to be honest. I don't necessarily want to make a judgment in that regard, but uh, when the punishment is just a slap uh, on the wrist, then, then certainly I could imagine it potentially happening in the future. Cool. And before we go, two last things I wanted to dig into in the comments there. I think this one kind of puts a bow on what we've been talking about from a Stevie 100 WL. Uh, if Tony versus Justin ends up being a bloodbath, it's not going to look good to major media right now. More of a statement than an actual question. But I think that's kind of the overarching concern of what we're dealing with in general here. Uh, we don't know how close the nearest local hospital is going to be to this fight at Tachi Pals. We imagine neither of these guys, Tony Ferguson and Justin Gaethje, or maybe others on the card, but those two in particular, they never leave a fight, you know, looking as clean and fresh as ever. It's mostly, you know, I know Gaethje's had the three first round knockouts, but it's usually him or their opponent gets pretty badly hurt leaving there. Um, then you could be sending them to a hospital that's a dangerous environment. You know, we're talking about maybe giving COVID-19 tests to everyone on the card when there is people in the entire world who are, you know, in much more desperate need of those tests than just some cage fighters, you know, going in to give us an entertainment on Saturday night. Uh, do you think the, again, the risk versus the reward of doing what they're doing is ultimately worth it? There's so many different elements and layers to this whole situation. I think the comment really points out a big one that really confines a lot of them together. Just what do you make of uh, what Stevie 100 WL had to say there? Yeah, it's certainly interesting because then if, if, if something like that happens, then that's what I'm saying. The criticism is warranted, uh, whether whether Dana and the UFC don't like it, like it or not. It is warranted because we're, we're like this is something the whole world is dealing with. And, and like in my side of the world, I'm not hearing of extreme cases, but every single day on the news, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing about thousands and thousands of people and people saying that. Uh, friends of theirs or, or, or relatives or family members are, are passing away from this virus. So it's no joke. I mean, the, the whole world wouldn't be on lockdown if it wasn't so serious. So for sure. And I just think, unfortunately, it's one of those things until it happens, God forbid it happens. And like they, they'll, they'll take it day by day. Honestly, that's what they're doing. So if, if, if something does happen, then of course the criticism will be warranted. And of course it's a massive risk. Uh, that the UFC is taking in terms of everything, not only uh, their fighters, but the, the the staff and just everybody involved. Um, if, if anything happens, then it, it is going to be a massive problem and they are going to get a ton of media backlash and it's going to be media backlash, not just from us MMA media, but, but, but the whole world. For sure. And last but not least, Farah, um, one more question before we get out of here from George's George J. Who would win one on one on the hoops court? Young Mike Bond or Farah? I don't even know what he's saying here. Love basket ballerina or something like that. I don't even know. What <laughs> well, I've never, I, I've never seen you play, Mike, but uh, I'm, I'm confident in my ability. We can put that put that to the test sometime, maybe MSG or something. <laughs> For sure. Well, hopefully uh, we can get back to the Middle East again next year. I mean, of course, you and I uh, met in person uh, in Abu Dhabi for the Habib and Poirier. Yeah. But, uh, they're going to be back there again, so hopefully we can uh, – you know, make that happen in person. Hopefully the weather isn't so damn hot there again next time. That was out of control in September. I think I'd have the advantage there. If, if it's my home court, then I'm more accustomed to the heat than you up in Canada for sure. All right, well, we'll play one game in the heat, one game in the snow, and then it'll be even for both of us. Sounds good for now. <laughs> All right, well, that does it for us here today. I really appreciate everyone joining. Uh, we will be back for more of these in the future. I won't be here next week, but I think John Morgan will be back with uh, Farah or one of the other great people we have on our staff. So thank you so much for tuning in, and uh, keep it locked to the coverage on MMAJunkie.com.